Okay, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to Dev Day 2018. Uh, this is our third Dev Day and we have Masud Koha from Lancaster University here as our keynote. I don't know if you remember Masud, but you gave our very first Dev Day keynote virtually three years ago. So it's really good to have you back here today. Um, in, in, in real time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I still remember it well because the demo I was trying to do failed miserably. <laughs> never do live demos without internet. Are you sure you want to do a live demo later? Well, I'll this one. <laughs> <laughs> so today is a very informal, sorry, before we get started, Ms. Wood, just a few housekeeping things. So the meal breaks, um, tea and coffee are down on level five where we were yesterday. The toilets are just out this store and um, sort of in the, the men's is just next door, the ladies is across the corridor on the other side. Um, maybe if we just do a quick round table just to give an indication of who's here, introduce yourselves just quickly so that Masood has an idea of who you are and, and, and you each do as well. So maybe. Okay. I'm Ed Curtis, I'm Library Content and Discovery Manager at the University of New England, so we come from New South Wales. I'm Dave Robertson, I'm um, the Systems and Applications Team Leader at the State Library of New South Wales. Jim Mitchell, the University of Sydney, I'm Jay Peter. I'm Annabeth Mori, I'm Systems and Technology Manager at the University of Sydney, Rachel Reynolds, I'm Uni at Bay, Hopkins, Manager of Digital Library Services at Flinders University. Um, I'm Deborah Pritchett. I'm from the Department for Digital Services at Flinders University. I'm Stuart Stocks, Manager of Technical Information Resources at Western Sydney University. I'm Brian Jackson from Flinders University in Adelaide. I work in the Library Assistance. Yeah, I've got a specific role in electronic resources and the system scene at Monash University. I'm John Pixier, I'm a resource services manager at Swindon University. I'm Mark Hibble, I work in resource materials at Palmer. I'll introduce myself anyway. Uh, well, first of all, I can very easily say this that you probably know a lot more about this stuff than I do. Uh, but I'll try my best to give you a good coverage of where we are up to, what I think about digital strategy and some of the other things that go with that. Uh, so as I was originally writing this, I was like, okay, so digital strategy, a balancing act. It truly is a balancing act because uh, the, the more I was doing it, the more I'm realizing, okay, maybe uh, sometimes we get overboard and sometimes we are underwhelming in some of our approaches. So it's a short history of an ambitious team, and I'm saying this genuinely team because I don't do any of this myself anymore, uh, who curbed their enthusiasm for the larger good. And I'll explain what that actually means. Um, I'm the Assistant Director for Digital Innovation and Research Services at Lancaster University Library. So my remit basically covers all of libraries, digital infrastructure, systems, services, research data, open access, digital scholarship, humanities, uh, pretty much all of that. I also wear a slightly different hat, which is um, uh, I'm also the project lead for digital research across the university, which means that anything to do with digital research, i.e. from inception of a research project all the way to its delivery, I'm, or my team is involved in that. Um, and that's quite a massive undertaking because of the huge amount of research that's going on at the university at any given time. Um, but more appropriately, I think, if, if I want to define it, it would be short history of an ambitious team who told their evil overlord to shh and calm down. And basically, they very genuinely called me the evil overlord, uh, but hopefully in a nice way. Right, so background. And um, I'm not crazy, and but I will talk a bit about me purely because that will give you some context. So I've got a computer science background. Uh, my bachelor's and master's were both in computer science, my PhD almost to the end was in computer science and then I decided academia is not for me and moved into libraries and information world. Uh, from a personal perspective, I've had both private and 
public industry experience. So I used to work in private industry before I moved into the acad academic world. My main job, my first development job started at uh, Baldwin Libraries at University of Oxford, um, where I started as a web slash digital library assistant, then an applications developer, then an applications architect, then an enterprise architect, then a knowledge manager, all within a span of five years. Um, and then moved to Lancaster as head of digital innovation. I used to code, okay-ish code. <laughs> no, no developer would ever say that they can code perfectly. Maybe some can, uh, at least I can't, um, but not anymore. So I'm sad about that, because there's a sense of satisfaction that comes with actually solving a problem while you're developing, and that's no longer there for me. But I really enjoy the leadership part of it, so there's at least a different sense of satisfaction for me. So one thing I would convey is, yes, the transition is difficult, Letting go of development is difficult, but it's possible. And I think we need more digital leaders in the future. So please do think about that going forward. A little bit more about me from an Exlibris perspective. So I've worked with quite a lot of Exlibris products, um, but also non-Exlibris products. Um, I was responsible for Oxford's Primo implementation and their Aleph implementation. If you want to talk about scale, that's a good place to be. 124 plus libraries, all with their 124 plus ADMs in Aleph, for those who might know ADMs in Aleph. The Z308 table was about two and a half thousand lines. Um, so nightmare of a project to deal with, uh, but at the same time gave you tremendous amount of experience. Primo is much simpler. Um, also dabbled with Metalib and SFX, absolutely hated Metalib, loved SFX. I don't know why. I don't know any Metalib users still here. Good. Oh, no, one. Okay. Uh, and at um, <coughs> Lancaster, Leganto implementation, Explorer partnership, um, Alma and Prima implementation, but because of, they, they kind of happened when I was joining, I don't take any credit for that. And of course, lots of repositories and stuff. I mean, I've dabbled with almost any repository platform, DSpace, eBrains, Fedora, you name it, and I've tried it at least. Um, and preservation systems and other things. Right, so today, a little bit about team. So uh, this is not just a development team. I'm not that lucky that I have a big development team, but I've got about four developers, um, but also a search services team. Uh, this is not the full team. A lot of them were on holiday. But what one of the key things we did was we really, really focused on what our vision would be. And I'll just tell four points. So our vision is to enhance the reach, impact, and potential of digital research across the institution. That's the starting point from where we start from. Uh, to inspire moments of optimism, innovation, and excellence. Um, when we talk or show other developers this, what they, they often question, what is these moments of optimism? But because we work so closely with the research community, sometimes you can see that spark happening in their eyes. When you tell them the digital way of thinking, where they were going to do something which would have taken them months which can be done in literally hours. They, you can see that moment of optimism and encouragement that's coming through. To create value and to make a difference for our stakeholders is kind of linked with the same thing. And to be partners in digital research processes. I think we, we really do want that partnership model from the very beginning. And I think what we say to our researchers and our academics is actually, if you speak to us from a very early point, we can actually change the research question that you're about to ask. And that's a difficult pill to swallow because you can't tell researchers how to do research, but you can tell them how to do it more efficiently. And I think that's what we try to do. Right, so digital strategy. Uh, Lancaster, when I joined about five years ago, was a very different place to where it's now. And uh, one of the key drivers behind that was that technology was moving at a very high and rapid pace. It was outpacing our capacity to learn and deliver on that. Um, we also predict the major impact of machine learning, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, blockchain. I've mentioned these briefly in the, in the other keynote as well. Uh, we have a big growth in digital scholarship requirements. That's becoming quite massive at Lancaster and across the UK in general. We really want to develop more evidence-driven uh, decision-making. We want to really show that the library has an impact and library really provides value for money uh, for the resources. And there's a big lack of general purpose digital skills in library and academic staff, and also way of thinking. And um, again, I was giving this example in one of my talks that um, if we can achieve our academics using the panels and technology, that would be a big achievement in its own right. 
because about 60 to 70 percent of them still struggle with switching between a laptop screen to a VGA screen to anything else. So even those levels of skills are still not there. Um, but that's what we are aiming for. So Lancaster context, uh, one of the most important things, in my opinion, we did was we really pressured the university strategic management to add something different in our strategy. Every strategy that we were reading at the university level was almost exactly the same. We want to be world leaders in research and this and that. But we said, what, what makes Lancaster unique? And we've got a new enabler in there in our own strategy, which is, we call it the fifth dimension of the strategy. And that is for Lancaster to be a digitally innovative university. And what that does is give us this card that we can go and play and say, actually, if you want to be a digitally innovative university, are you sure this is the best way to do it? Have you spoken to us? Have you spoken to IT services, et cetera? Uh, we also have a full digital strategy for the university based on that, which is called Digital Lancaster. I won't go into the detail, but there are three goals in there, digital research, digital teaching and learning, and digital engagement. Uh, digital research is led by the library not by any other part. Digital, uh, digital teaching and learning is led by our Institute of Education and digital engagement is by our Pro Vice Chancellor for Engagement. And three enablers, which are digital fluency, digital services, and digital innovation. So fluency, everyone would know about this, but to increase those literacies across the board, but through innovation and services, right? And I've already mentioned that the library leads on digital research goal. And in terms of library context, we want to be a digitally innovative library. If the university wants to be digitally innovative, all of its parts have to be digitally innovative. We also want to be a digitally fluent library. So some of the things that absolutely shocked us when we ran a large exercise in the library about digital fluency and digital capabilities of our staff. So we did a what's called a 24 hour, uh, seven day cycle with each of them. So we said, where do you use digital technologies in your 24 day cycle over a seven day period. And we did this exercise in a, in a focus group one to one with all of them. And we were really surprised. Some of the staff at junior level, so Lancaster is surrounded by fields. So they also work in farms or have farms of their own. And the amount of technology they were using to basically manage their cattle was astonishing over iPads, except that they weren't really using the same level of technology or same level of expertise in their work. So where are the transferable skills and where they aren't and how we can use that. Innovation and diversity of thinking is a core principle. So whenever we talk about innovation and diversity, we just say we can't talk about it from a technical perspective. It has to cut across the library. So people from different teams will come and talk about it. And for that very reason, we formed an innovation group. <coughs> and this was the um, opening statement for that innovation group which is to be one of the top libraries in the UK, Lancaster has to take a transformative <laughs> approach towards building innovation in its approach and practices. And basically the key thing here is that we want to actively seek partnerships, inspire creativity, develop leadership and build confidence. And it's th that kind of bold approach that the library is really embracing to really take that next step and say, how can we go further than any other standard research library? And a another paragraph I would read very quickly from that, again, I want go into too much detail because there's a lot to read, is to develop a strong insight into our customer's behavior. So not only analytics, but lots of ethnographic approaches, user experience approaches, lots of other things that go with that, to develop data-driven services. So no longer is the case that an academic librarian would come and say, this is a service we want to introduce because the immediate question would say is why, where's the data supporting that? And that really challenged people in the first instance, but they are all getting used to it now. Uh, but the idea is, unless we have data, we can't refine our services. We can introduce services, but our ethos is to continuously improve them, and data is absolutely crucial to that. But data only will do one part of it. It's the attitude that goes with it. That's the more crucial part. And it's that requires development of an attitude that motivates staff to consistently improve services and to challenge stagnant services, including Alma at Lancaster. I would be first to put our hands up and say we were great when we implemented Alma. We've not really done much with it since then. <laughs> Sometimes when services work efficiently and take on month by month, you start losing the focus on them. And I think that was one of the issues we were having. Right, so the innovation group worked quite extensively for over a course of a year, and these were some of the initial outcomes. So most ideas actually turned out to be non-digital in their nature, but still very useful for the efficiency improvements in the library. So one example of that is on our shelves, we had these class marks 
which is saying in this shelf you find these books they said why can't we divide it saying on this side of the shelf you find these books and on this side of the shelf you find these books simple as that but no nobody thought about it and really improved students experience of that some did require digital work but more required cultural change uh, which doesn't come easy uh, but these are some of the ideas that require digital work so better indoor navigation so students find it difficult to find books or the location we use a very archaic class mark system called bliss which is completely against its name <laughs> it's extremely difficult to use and i've been working with that for five years and i still find it problematic to find books a uh, better room booking system which was um, a quick one to do so we did introduce libcal um, but we are going one step further about more automated room booking systems and other things sensor based room bookings and other things Inquiry management, um, nobody actually was tracking anything that they were receiving about what kind of inquiries are coming in, how they are satisfying the need of that. So we introduced some of those. Initially Zendesk for research services, Jira for technical, now the university is adopting Jira across the board. Uh, streamlining of resource sharing, uh, I won't talk much about it because Nish is going to talk about it anyway. Um, Primo learning wizard. So one of the ideas was that when new people come into the university, wouldn't it be nice that first time they load Primo there's a learning wizard that go th they go through. Uh, the issue was we don't push people to sign in, so we can't really tell whether they're new or not. So more people are getting frustrated by seeing it again and again. So we kind of stopped with that idea, but we have a different kind of way of learning that now. Better visitor registration, that's just literally improvement of forms than anything else. And staff points on each floor. Um, you might say, how's that digital? That means staff is on each floor. Why is that digital? We can't afford staff on each floor. So we are now looking at whether we can put staff like equipment on each floor, i.e. Amazon Alexa or something like that, where basic queries can be answered on different points or different areas of the library. So people don't have to come all the way from end of C floor library to A floor mid to just ask a question about when are you closing today or can I renew my books or something like that. Um, not all digital work comes through these ideas. We also have big projects. So, um, Stream on the cloud, Leganto, uh, Disk Research Data Shared Service is probably the biggest one we are working on. Exploro, currently a partnership. Pure DMA Online is another big one I'll talk about, so I'll come to these again. So uh, let's talk about our current projects, or little pieces of code as well, and they all they all matter to us. So the big one is the Research Data Shared Service. Um, so the idea behind it is that we want to advance research data management through collaboration across the UK. It's a nationally um, intended shared service. It's a research and development project. It started as that, but it's now about to become a service. It's a beta service currently. Um, and it started from research at um, risk co-design process. So JISC and universities have changed their mentality. So we all work in a co-design fashion, now, or at least we try to work in a co-design fashion now which means that uh, none, none of the ideas come from a single university. We all come together, we produce ideas and other universities vote on that, whether that's a common problem or not. And on that basis, investment is directed towards achieving a particular project. So that's the core design part of it. The second, so that's the co-inception part of it, to be honest. Then you have these constant meetings that actually help code design based on those requirements. So there's a lot of agile principles coming in except over a longer period of time. So the sprint would take months, for example, <laughs> which is not very agile, but it's, it's a start. Um, the shared service provides a framework agreement, which means we are not trying to develop new services by any means across all of the components of research data, which could be many, but it provides a framework agreement. So Figshare is part of it, Xlibris would become part of it, at least we're trying that at the moment. And then um, there are three main, main components, a repository preservation and planning, so Xlibris can say, we will work with the repository lot, therefore we'll put Exploro in there, or they might say we'll work with the preservation lot and therefore we'll put Rosetta in there. Uh, Fixture has, is coming on the repository lot. Uh, there's a JESC repository as well. On preservation lot, we have Preservica and Archimatica, so lots of vendors are on board. Uh, but the big issue is the whole service wants interoperability. So what this service provides is a central interoperability framework, which is basically like this. So you have a repository, could be anything. There's no distinction. Everything that you deposit in that repository will go to a messaging schema, which is a, a, an Amazon Kinesis stream at the moment. Um, then everyone else listening to that stream would pick those messages up and take action. So for example, there's an or fully automated interaction 
from um, well, actually that's not true at this time, but Samvera to Archive Mythica. So if you are using Samvera, which is Hydra, I don't know whether anyone uses Hydra Samvera here. Does anyone use it? Okay, so that's an open source repository, um, uh, mostly American, but quite popular in the UK as well. If you deposit a research data asset or a publication in there, it will say new research data deposited. This is the metadata. These are the files. These are the files metadata. That message goes onto the messaging stream. Archimatica is listening on it. It picks it up saying, OK, I need to deposit this. It fulfills my preservation policy. So it archives it, generates the archival information packages um, from the submission information packages. It sends a message back onto the messaging layers. I've done it. The reporting lot listens to all these messages and say, these are the new entries in the reports. And the idea is that there's a standard scheme underneath. So everyone follows that scheme as a new vendor and comes on board. Um, and the, the this is just the first stage. And the future stage is that all that data is then aggregated to a national research data aggregation layer, which would be research data discovery service. And um, therefore, researchers will only have to go to a single place to find all research data across the UK as well as um, more intelligent stuff like machine learning and artificial intelligence can happen over there. Right, so reporting lot doesn't have much, so Lancaster decided to develop a piece of software in that area. So it's called Data Management Administration Online. Uh, some of you might have heard of Data Management Planning Online, DMP Online. So this is kind of a sister product to that. And uh, again, I, it was proposed at Research at Risk, came out as an R&D project about to be launched as a service. It's based on top of the shared service. And what it does is it gives you a bird's eye view of all RDM activities that are happening in your institution or all open science activities that are happening in your institution. It also allows you to benchmark services across other institutions as well as develop local KPIs. So for example, an institution over here might have a KPI saying we want to achieve 80% compliance with our open access publications. Uh, but 60% compliance with our open data mandate. So you can set those KPIs in the background and not only the system would be able to tell you whether you're achieving them, but it will also tell you what your similar institutions are achieving. So you can then see whether you need to do more action or not. It also has different views. So a pro chancellor or DVC research don't want to see all the nitty gritty. They just want to know what the compliance factors are or all the other good things are. So they have a separate view. An IT manager would have a separate view. A research data manager would have a separate view. An open access manager would have a separate view. So you can all see different things in the background. Um, and it's very simple. Uh, it's based on uh, Vue.js for the front end. Um, Postgres in the background, but it's about to move to Aurora, uh, Amazon Aurora. It's all API driven, so the front end can be replaced quite quickly from the back end on that basis. Uh, and because it's API driven, there's a Tableau web connector as well, so you don't actually have to use the the front end, you can just connect it to your institutional uh, data warehouse or um, visualization tools as well. Um, again, similar thing, basically the underlying layer is this research data shared service, everything is messages and event space, goes into the ingest system for DM online, and then goes to dashboard for reporting or endpoints for Tableau, et cetera. Um, last slide on this is more about the technical architecture, so um, not very nicely it's a screenshot so you can see the spelling mistakes have still been marked as red. <laughs> they're not spelling mistakes, they're just our own words. Uh, so there's a tenant configuration service which you can use to define your own institution specific parameters in the background. There's also an authorization and authentication service based on JSON web token authorization service. So it, it's SAML compliant as well. So if you, you can hook it into your own institution's authentication system. And it's also privilege based or role based. So some, some people can have more privileges than others. Um, every message that goes on the message gateway comes to the data store. Uh, at the moment, it's monolithic, but we are converting into microservices. And uh, of course, additional sources come in. So one of the ones that we are interested in is Zendesk, because all of our research data inquiries go in Zendesk. So we want to also ingest that. So basically, you can get your full institutional picture in a single place. You don't have to go to many, many systems. And of course, there's a pure adapter as well. So anyone who's using pure can also ingest just, uh, that data. The ideology here is we don't try to do as many individual systems. We try to push them onto the gateway because that keeps the standardization across the board. Um, also, for the API front end, we have a REST um, standard REST-based interface, but we also have a GraphQL interface. 
so we can build knowledge networks in the future and more interesting things to do with that. Right, um, another project, uh, it's not really a project, it's a small piece of code. It's, we call it Mint, is because when we, um, we adopted research data practices about three and a half years ago, so we signed up to data site to Mint UIs, uh, and we use Pure, and Pure one wasn't, so I'm kind of saying what the problem statement is saying, Pure wasn't able to mint DOIs, that came later. And when it came, it wasn't really using all these standard data site metadata fields. So that's bad. Also, you can't reserve DOIs. Most people would like to reserve a DOI before they actually make it open in public. So we designed our own little piece of software. It's, by the way, open source, so anyone can use it as long as you have Pure, because it works with Pure. And basically, all you have to do is add your Pure ID in there and just click on mint a DOI or reserve a DOI, and it just does it. And it picks up all the elements that you have in pure and pushes that into data site and also does regular batch updates as well. So that makes it just very, very easy and simple. It also supports your own local uh, prefix, prefixes and suffixes. So if you're minting a DUI through pure, it will give it a, an anonymous ID, kind of a UUID based DUI. But in this case, we will mint slash research, slash, no, slash Lancaster, slash research data, slash number or slash Lancaster slash thesis slash number. So you, of course there are different types you can mint DOIs for as well. So if anyone is interested in minting DOIs and not sure where to start, good point. Um, library digitization service. So one thing we were really facing again and again was the issue that uh, people were not complying with copyright licensing agency uh, guidelines, common problem across the world, I think as well as um, they were depositing stuff in Moodle, Moodle course rolls over, the links break, and then they're like, why can't we have the same link again? There was no concept of permalinks either. So we developed um, our own digitization service. Um, we thought about it, whether we should buy one or, or use the copyright licensing agency's own digitization service. But because we are international, we have a campus in China and Ghana. Um, we also have to very carefully look at privacy issues. So we developed our own. Um, it does provide a queuing system. So you'll have um, queues of new requests and we use library assistance to do all of the digitization uh, and they all have their own views. So for complex inquiries, it goes to academic librarians for non-complex inquiries, it goes straight to a library assistant. Uh, and it gives us reports and downloads, usage metrics. If a course has 100 students and 2000 downloads are happening, it will give us alerts saying something's not right, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's another one. I'm going through these quickly purely because um, I just want to give you a flavor rather than detail. The Gantt implementation was also quite interesting because we were the second institution in the world to migrate from Thales Aspire to Leganto by about two weeks. Otherwise, we would have been the first. Um, but Edinburgh was the other one and we were working very closely. So they benefited from our technical development and we benefited from their advocacy approaches because they had really good advocacy approaches for implementation. Um, and again, we have these issues about um, campuses across the world. So how do you give them a different way of manually entering some of that, as well as integration with Moodle. So I, was, I think I was mentioning this to Kendall yesterday, that we had to develop our own um, enhanced integration because by default, the LTI integration between uh, Moodle and Leganto was you click it and it opens the whole reading list. And we wanted a uh, chunk by chunk, week by week integration of citations from um, Leganto into Moodle. So with that uh, integration has been developed, so an academic can go into Moodle, say this is my first week course, pick citations from Leganto, it will open a Leganto interface and they said this citation in this week, this citation in this week, this citation in this week, and it will bring that and embed that into Moodle with single click access to the resources. Uh, we also have massive Aspire API issues. Again, no, not many Aspire users, as far as I could tell from yes. Anyone using Aspire? Very, very popular in the UK. Almost everyone was using Aspire in the UK. And um, Aspire have two different APIs. Uh, one is the REST style APIs, and the other one are linked data style APIs, uh, except that none of them send the complete information back. So what you had to do was get uh, some information from the, linked, uh, from the um, REST APIs first, then call the linked data APIs. And the linked data APIs were really, really slow because there was no way to filter what information you want. It would just dump everything back. And that was so slow. So we actually had to develop our own local cache because it would have taken us about 18 days to do it otherwise. So our local cache 
still took about three and a half days to develop, but at least we could then just query that rather than um, all the other things. So not, not of importance here, but in the UK, it's very popular because a lot of people are now converting from Aspire to Leganto. Uh, both codes are available open source, by the way. So if you're interested in that Moodle integration, that's not even a code. If you use Moodle, you can just install that plugin. It's a Moodle plugin now. And the first one is the Aspire migration code. Uh, noise reporting, again, you can see we are going all across the board. It's not research, not teaching and learning, but all kinds of services. So you have big issue in library about noise, and people get really annoyed by it. Uh, even though we have floor classification, it doesn't always work. Um, so at that time, we had no idea or no real reason to develop noise reporting. What we were really trying to develop was in the in indoor navigation. Uh, a map system that different people can map different items to, not just books, but different reading rooms, different um, group study rooms, toilets, etc. And then people can use that to find different parts of the building. And he said, actually, can we not extend that? And we started extending that into a much bigger project. So um, one, we wanted to find out whether the noise is real or perceived. And two, we had a library maps project which we extended for noise reporting. So the library map project takes any CAD plan in and it breaks it into any kind of structure. So it's, it uses the, uh, God, what's the map API? Um, there's a, a jQuery based map a library that it uses. And you can then uh, segment each map into each segment. You can do drawings on it saying this is this, this is that. And it remembers it and into a local database and then people can query that. So we did that for noise reporting, and this is how people would report a noise. So they can select which floor it is on, and they can select where they are. Uh, it's often we can detect where they are based on the Wi-Fi access point that they're linking with, but they, they don't have to be on Wi-Fi, so they can also select where they are. And then we ask them to give anonymous comments. Uh, what it does is it gives us something like this, uh, i.e. the backend infrastructure, so we can generate reports on what are the common patterns for noise, but also generate heat maps on where the problem areas are. And what that allows us to do is take more proactive action on, ooh, maybe the furniture layout is not right, or maybe you need more staffing in that area or anything along those lines. And that really helps us in determining how to take further action. Uh, we are also extending this now for safety reporting and for other things, i.e. if people are feel, feeling threatened at any time, especially late night, they can just, it's a single click report that goes to the porters then and they can come and take uh, action on that basis. And it's also something we are now um, developing. It, it was always developed as software as a service, but now it's almost a platform as a service. So other universities are also starting to use this. Right, we also have a labs environment so not everything we do is a project or a service um, so lots of little things go through the labs project scheme first and then move into a project or a service so i even we need to get things done dirty and quickly basically um, so library opening hours i think someone uh, lincoln i think is probably talking about it later about your api um, so that was an issue for us primarily because um, of cms our cms is not an easy one to use and uh, either you have to train a lot of staff to use the CMS to update the opening hours. Uh, and even then it takes about four to six hours for it to update because it goes from that to staging to stage, it's, sorry, from that to dev to staging to production. So it's a six hour cycle almost. And sometimes you have to really change your opening hours or news like that because of an emergency or anything else. So what we did was we um, basically developed a Lambda in Amazon, which uh, people can push an Excel file into and it just converts that and pushes that back through an API interface into the CMS. So we just have a piece of code in CMS which reads that Lambda. Um, and if you're interested, this is how we do it. So there's a function to process upload the CSV files that updates the database, and the function is just library open and it tells you is library open or not. So when we developed it, that was a, the only reason to develop it, but then we introduced chat service, and we only wanted people to use chat when library is not staffed. So we use the same function to say, show the chat widget when library is not open, basically. We are 24 seven, by the way. So the library not open means library not, um, is not staffed by library staff. Another one is uh, research connections. Um, so you'll notice we do a lot with this research. That's the advantage of being a combined research and digital team that we do do a lot with research. 
So the problem statement is we don't fully know where our academics collaborate with um, internationally and whether those academics still exist at Lancaster. So yes, Sarval can really help, but there are so many other collaborations that don't result in a publication or a publication that's not indexed by Scopus. And therefore we want a fuller picture. So everything is in pure. What we do is extract a lot of this data out of pure, then speaks a lot to Sival, Scopus, and also Twitter, because what we are interested in, at the end goal of this is to identify which academics have those international connections, but are also prominent on social media. So we can develop that further and see whether we can use that to develop our international league uh, table rankings even further. So yeah, so it also helps us develop independent social media campaigns. So there's a campaign in Lancaster uh, looking at top 100 researchers who also are prominent in social media to see whether we can use them to influence other researchers to say Lancaster is the best university in the world uh, and York in the future. <laughs> Another one is preservation. So again, goes back to we have research data in pure, but it's not easy to get it out or preserve it. So can we not automate it? So it's literally just experimentation, a day worth of effort in this one. So we ran a trial of extracting research data out of pure and into archive Medica. It's never gone into production, but we know it's possible. So that, that's the whole purpose of this exercise. And again, the code is there if you ever want to try it. Uh, another one was research data metadata, RDF. So again, similar basis that we know research data has, is there, but not, other machine, not many machines can harvest it. Um, so research data discovery service, for example, we really want that to harvest it. And um, Pure doesn't have an OAI PMH interface for research data. So we said, why don't we just create an RDF based uh, representation that uh, is then given as a Sparkle endpoint and research data discovery service can harvest that. So again, it's very similar way. We just pick the data out, we convert it into RDF. It's literally another day and a half kind of experiment. Uh, another one is research outputs annou announcement. So this is not just data, but any research output that goes into Pure. The idea here is that our academics are often very busy and they don't often talk about their research outputs on social media and other places. So can we generate an announcement for them automatically? So again, when someone submits something into Pure, we ran a trial of extracting key metadata out and forming different forms of announcements. So one specifically for LinkedIn, one specifically for Twitter based on the character counts. At that time, it was 140. Um, one for uh, Facebook, although nobody ever wants Facebook uh, in an academic circle. And uh, again, never went into production, but we know it's possible. And we, we've done those API integrations. Um, so that was our kind of labs approach. So lots of labs projects that run as experimentation and some of them do convert into production services. Noise reporting was one of them started as a labs project and moved into production service. Now, one of the reasons I want to talk about thing is the balance. So again, I'm go back to the future thinking elements. So remember this slide from, from the previous one that we want to do all these amazing things. And that's where I said to my team, let's do all those amazing things. So let's forget about all the other things we should do. So let's start learning about machine learning, artificial intelligence, neural networks, blah, 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 you name it. And they were all trying to learn it. Uh, two issues, one, learning without doing is very difficult. And two, it was at the expense of something else. And that expense was the real need. So the real need in the library was uh, adjudicated when we ran a digital enablers exercise. So we said to all of our staff in the library and I sat with all of them and said, what is it that you need digitally to really achieve what you want to achieve? And it came into, a, we want to work better with Alma. We need better Alma analytics. Um, implementation of a preservation system, although only came from two people. Um, digital object creation and support with that. So lots of people create digital objects, but none of them know how to do it professionally. So how, how can they do it professionally? Wayfinding and toilet fault reporting, that was one of the biggest ones. Uh, Tableau introduction and support, not many people know how to use Tableau or even know about it at all. Uh, password management, um, just I don't know how to store my password there. And we introduced a system and we taught one of our groups as, a, as an exercise multiple times. And then they are still not getting it because they had all of their passwords stored in Chrome said, you really need to get rid of those if you really want to use a password management system. And better room or software for remote teaching. So it's, it's all over the place, but none of it talks about machine learning or artificial intelligence or internet of things or any of those snazzy things. So the snazzy stuff that we said, okay, <laughs> we'll do is we'll 
learn and adopt Amazon infrastructure. So we've decided not to do anything locally for two reasons. Our IT services take a very long time to deliver anything. But the more I've spoken here, actually, our IT services seem good. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they can take up, take up to a week to deliver a large scale VM, whereas I think over here it could be even longer. Uh, and we are also developing a local caching infrastructure for all Alma based interactions. Uh, that's to speed up some of the processes, but also give us a different authorization interface so we can hook it into uh, messenger bots and chat bots and Alexa skills and those kind of things. Um, IoT infrastructure, we already have some in the library. So the library has over 120 sensors, uh, beacon-based sensors. Uh, we are introducing more sensors to monitor temperature and noise as well. Um, thermal imaging cameras, I've spoken to Nish about this as well. Uh, we want to do more people counting uh, and more intelligent people counting in different parts of the library for many reasons. Uh, and to support natural language touch points, as I was saying, different flows and different areas of flows. Uh, messenger bots, Slack bots, et cetera, I've already talked about. And staff infrastructure. I think it's often underappreciated, but we need to really push our staff infrastructure, i.e. start to develop skills in machine learning primarily for our own staff. And that's because I had to pick one and say, which one is it that we want to invest our time in? And machine learning is the one. The not so snazzy stuff, stuff that we'll work on, but it's very important, process review. So we've decided as a library that every process will be reviewed and every process will have the digital team as core part of it. So if you do deals with uh, external visitors, it will be reviewed and digital will be part of it. If you're dealing with um, distance learners, digital will be part of it. If you're dealing with acquiring a new physical book, digital team will be part of it, basically across the board. Uh, Excel skills, so we are introducing more Excel skills, but even we don't have them in the digital team. So we are actually asking other people to come on. Uh, Alma Analytics training, people don't like Xlibris training, so uh, some acquisitions librarians are learning SQL. That's a good thing, but they, they don't need to. So I think we're really trying to help them on that. And analytical thinking in general. So not many of them use Google Analytics, but that's an easy one to use. Actually also quite complex to use, depending on how you look at it. Uh, but we're also introducing Hotjar or tools like that. Anyone know, use Hotjar or have heard of Hotjar? So it's a very good system. Have a look at it. It's basically Google Analytics style system. Uh, you embed the code in, but it will actually record how people are actually using the site, generate heat maps, do funnel based uh, customer feedback guidances and other things. Right, quickly moving on, skills development. So for development team, our skills at the moment are all on serverless architecture. So they're all learning how to use lambdas or functions as a service, Git, and uh, they all know how to use it, but not as efficiently as they can. Continuous integration, containerization, primarily Docker and machine learning. For the other library stuff, we want to focus on introducing digital way of thinking through combination of micro learning. So we've introduced these five minute learning exercises, guided learning. So Slack was introduction of Slack was guided learning, training and embedding ourselves in their processes. And we also have introduced a new way of working, which is called rapid improvement exercises i.e. we don't need to invest in large infrastructure if you can solve your problem quickly and rapidly. So these are three example problems that we want to do. Turn away analytics. So lots of people are talking in Anzreg about analyzing the usage data, but I don't know whether people analyze turn away analytics. Um, so basically how many people, so if you bought five licenses and a sixth person has tried to use the same ebook, that's a turn away to them. Uh, and we want to basically acquire more licenses on that basis. Uh, also, zero uh, zero search analytics. So if someone's searched something in Primo and zero results have come back, um, Jesse Donahue's presentation, I remember quite explicitly. That was very good. Uh, and departmental resource use it. So the, the conversations about uh, Splunk on that front were really useful as well. And last two slides. I know I'm kind of running over time. Uh, future projects are the only snazzy stuff we'll do in the future. Uh, we'll continue with core projects. So the core projects for us are cache and IoT infrastructure, DMA online, uh, the data management administration online, library maps project, uh, and everything else from a development perspective becomes a labs project. And if you want to move from a labs project to a proper project, you need to go through an extra resourcing. So a lab project will turn into a normal project, which will then turn into a service project or service basically. But all of that will go into the planning cycle and will require additional development resource that needs to be asked for. And the only other thing we are going to do is the next gen digital humanities repository. 
So conversations have started between Cambridge, Lancaster, um, Edinburgh and Manchester. I haven't added York in there because I haven't yet started there, but that will also come. And there are three stages of this project. Stage one is we'll adopt Cambridge University Digital Library as it is. So as, if anyone's not seen it, just search CUDL or Cambridge University Digital Library, CUDL. Um, and it's quite nice. It's all triple IF based, very intense in terms of the kind of manifestos and transcriptions it can show, as well as um, has plugins for crowdsourcing, commenting, all those things that go with it. But stage two is to then develop a full recovery infrastructure. So Cambridge University Digital Library itself is a monolithic architecture at the moment. So we want to develop it into a microservices architecture where different digital humanities infrastructure and websites and resources can be input in different ways, but can also be preserved and recovered at any time. We also want to add value additional services like extend triple IF for other capacities include outside. So Universal Viewer is already doing some of that, but we want to see what other possibilities are there but also develop new visualizations on uh, non-traditional data like picture does, for example, Pixel or other things. Uh, and stage three is where we want to develop intelligence through machine learning. Nobody knows what or how it will look like at this time, but what we do know, and that there was a recent project that was being done in 2014 about um, artificial intelligence and fine arts. And the idea was that the, when they passed on those um, uh, images to this artificial intelligence engine, it allowed them to understand new correlations that they never explored before. And I think we are trying to do something similar with the humanities infrastructure. So that's the idea, but it is literally an idea at this time. Um, that's where I would stop. So I've gone through quite a lengthy stuff there. And I think I just wanted to give you a flavor of lots of things so you can really come to me later and say, what was that you said? That seemed crap. <laughs> or <laughs> what was that you said? I'm interested. Or, or actually what would be really useful is why. Why are you doing that? Because that would really help me with some of the interesting things back in my mind. Also, if there's something you're doing which is similar, I would be really keen to learn because that would really help. Um, and it's it's a continuous learning journey for all of us. So please feel free to tell me how to do it better. Thank you. Um, we've, we've got time for questions um, while we just I think one of the reasons we were a bit hesitant with Lit Count is um, because of the different variety of usage that it has. So LitCal is also used for room booking, but also used for um, appointment booking. Uh, but from all across the institution, including our mental health services, and we were very hesitant when GDPR came in to use it for anything else because we are going through a major audit of the system on what notes they might have added there, or what are the privacy issues or anything else. So we were just literally cleaning up data so we didn't need to stuff or anything else at that time. So that was almost like a last project converted into a service. Mm -hmm. We will revert back to let or any other better thing if we can find it. So that was the only reason we can look at this at that time. Yeah, GDPR is another story if you're interested. <laughs> the pain in the backside is what I would say. We have kept the same support if you're getting it now. Um, don't know is the short answer. Um, yes, there's a digital York team over there as well, uh, similar kind of numbers. But what's really beneficial in York, at least from a theoretical point of view, is that it's a converged service. So the library assets and IT are all part of converged service. And the director of library is also the deputy director of the converged service. So I think I'll have a lot more control over how we can use IT more as well. Um, but unless I'm there and I can experience what's there, uh, or what the cultural change problem <laughs> might be, I can't really comment on it. But convert services are both good and bad depending on how they are running. Is, is that a common all way converged or not? Libraries are always independent? Well, the library used to be part of information services with IT. Okay. But I don't know if it's 
that's big enough. It's a, it's a 10 year cycle in the UK, 10 year convergence, 10 year divergence, and then <laughs> all over again. So, yeah. And then let me just one last one. Is everyone done? I mean, yeah. Um, so, so many challenges and so many technologies. Um, what's your advice in terms of identifying where those priorities lay and which technologies you should be investing in? Uh, that's a very personal opinion then. Um, honestly, it, it doesn't matter in my opinion. If, if I'm giving a more uh, realistic answer, it doesn't matter. Use your developers expertise. But there are some technologies that are no longer worth investing in, in my opinion. If you're still using CGI or Pro over there. Um, PHP is very good, but try thinking of moving away as well. I think JavaScript primarily is the big one, um, both front end and back end. Um, but Python, so we are a Ruby shop primarily, so Ruby and Rails, Ruby, uh, but we are also a Python shop. I don't differentiate between the two. Most of my developers will code in Ruby or Ruby and Rails. Um, but they can equally code in Python or Django or uh, anything like that. Uh, if they come back to me and say, actually, we want to adopt um, I don't know, another framework in another language, I'll say no. Uh, but if they come to me and say, oh, we want to develop this in Angular, this in React, and this in Vue.js, I'll say, sure, I will go. In terms of maintenance, then I would say, you've had a chance to experiment with it. Is it worth us converting our services into this framework? Or you've learned it and it wasn't worth it. And if they say it wasn't worth it, then I said, just redo it in the other one. And it sounds like a crazy use of uh, time, but actually really keeps them happy and satisfied in the job, which is a really important thing for the companies because they can equally have double the money in a private industry if you want to go. Can I just add one more thing to that? I, I think Docker is a good thing to invest yeah. in as well because what that does is actually abstracts away all the language stuff. You're basically interacting with services directly. What's in, in the back end is almost irrelevant. So you can pretty much become technology agnostic if you're using Docker or development framework agnostic if you're using something like Docker. The other advantage of Docker is the duration. So when libraries become obsolete or if new VM or new version of Linux comes in and those previous libraries, that won't happen with Docker. So unless you're updating the Docker themselves. Anybody else? Go on, Mr. No, go for it. Sorry, sorry. Oh, it's a good idea. You seem to be doing a lot of bespoke development. Is there a concern about, I mean, what's the size of your development team? And I imagine it's pretty large to be able to maintain, it's not to maintain all this. Uh, no, it's not. I think, well, it depends on, again, it's all relative. So I don't know what large is doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, one to three core developers, one project based developer, and one person who looks after the discovery system. So that's the whole team. Yeah. Uh, but the three developers are um, fairly good, and they are all looking to the new technologies. Mm. Rather than, and that was a, a conscious decision because they were all, well, apart from one of them, two of them were Perl based. So they, it took us about three years to move from that framework of mine to everything about the framework, framework of mine. But they've, they've moved on. Uh, and the third developer really had because he recent graduate extremely enthusiastic and came with all these new ideas and all these new things and initially all, my job was literally to calm issues and make sure that they don't feel threatened and they use it as a more positive thing rather than a negative thing and once that's established then they all come on board and the skills are still not as good but they're almost there and that really helps plus they all work on the same technology stack so they can use to support each other Hi everybody, uh, you probably know who I am by now. Um, so today, uh, if, if you were at the talk yesterday, <coughs> I gave about the resource uh, sharing partner synchronization systems. Today, what I'm gonna do is show you how to set it up. Um, the, the objective that I'm trying to convey is that it's actually quite simple to do. So it's nothing too complicated. It's something you guys can all do. If your IT department doesn't wanna get involved, you can actually do it yourself on your own laptop if you really wanted to and have it running there. So the thing I want to really convey today is just kind of what goes in, what's involved in doing it and to make sure that you understand that you can probably do it yourselves. Um, <clears throat> now, now, oops, there's a, a GitHub I, GitHub pages a site which is attached to the, to the repository on GitHub, all the code's available. Uh, so if you go to this URL, you can see uh, the documentation for this. And 
Um, everything I'm about to do is already uh, documented here. So if you actually want to follow along on on the uh, uh, as I'm doing the demo, you're welcome to do so. It's pretty much almost every single command I'm going to type is going to be in here. And I apologize now because this is all going to be very text-based because it's all going to be happening on the command line. Uh, I'm going to be setting up the services and I'm going to be uh, showing you how to use them. <clears throat> Um, so the first, so first, I should probably just take one more step back here. So this is the process. So this is what we're going to be doing today. So steps one to four, basically setting up the, the system, right? So we're going to download and install and configure Elasticsearch. So when I spoke about the data store yesterday, that's what the data store is. It's basically just an Elasticsearch repository. Um, this is actually kind of an optional step because you could actually uh, go and get, some people might already have an Elasticsearch repository sitting somewhere that you probably used uh, for this sort of stuff, or you can actually go and get the software as a service, uh, Elasticsearch as a service. And there's a lot of providers for that, including Amazon. Um, there's Elastic.co, the people who make Elasticsearch provide that as a service. There's a one called Bonsai, which would cost you approximately like $20 a month, basically, to run this thing. <laughs> um, so that this step will show you how to set it up on your system, but also be aware that there are plenty of uh, Elasticsearch as a service providers out there as well, if you're not interested in actually maintaining an Elasticsearch data store yourself. <clears throat> um, so the second thing we're going to talk about is actually how to set up the indexes on Elasticsearch. Indexes are kind of like, in a relational database world, they're kind of like a table. Uh, and then how to clone, build, configure, and run the harvester. It sounds complicated, but it's actually quite simple. And same with the sync server, and then we'll play with the sync server and actually if everything goes well, we will hopefully be able to actually sync uh, the current state of events with our staging server, uh, Elma staging. Uh, so update all our partners. Um, so with that, having said that, I'll try and get started. I've forgotten to do one thing. So I'm actually gonna try and minimize the amount of actual typing I'm doing uh, because I type very slowly when people watch me. So, uh, so basically put in most of my stuff into a text editor and I will just be copying and pasting bits and pieces. I'll, I'll, I will be doing some typing as well. Though, so. um, okay, so what I've done here is I've just I've got a folder with all the stuff already downloaded, so I don't want to waste your time watching the download bar, downloading <laughs> various bits and pieces like software like Elasticsearch. So I've got Elasticsearch already downloaded, and I'm just gonna, I'm, first thing I'm gonna do is install that. So if you, as I said, if you go into the, uh, if you're following the process, this is step one, download, install, and configure Elasticsearch. So first two commands we do, these two here. So honestly, I really have very little idea what this actually does. But uh, if you're following the Elasticsearch installation guide, which is basically what I did, this is what they recommend you do. Basically, it's saying that there's pointers to uh, segments of memory and how many you can have. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, no, nothing very exciting. Uh, and you don't even need to worry about it. You just need to do it. OK, so that's step one. Um, second step, add an Elasticsearch user. Third step, we make a bunch of folders. So this is where we're going to be storing um, our Elasticsearch uh, installation, right? So if we go into this folder, we just created the ES folder, Elasticsearch folder. And we've created three folders, uh, additional folders under there. So we're going to have a folder for our data folder for our logs, which Elasticsearch will produce. And then if you want to create backups, we created a backup folder in there as well. <clears throat> okay, so now we want to install Elasticsearch. That's as simple as downloading, which I've already done, and extracting Elasticsearch in there. That's it, done. Um, that is now installed. You might want to give ownership to the Elastic user to it. Let's This is why you usually copy and paste. Yeah, you'll get there, don't worry. Okay. Oops. Jeez, that's even worse than usual. Okay, here we go. 
Um, let's see what can Okay, so we basically install Elasticsearch, create a symbolic link, just call Elasticsearch. If you want to upgrade in the future, you just change a symbolic link. Everything else in your system pretty much stays the same, right? Um, so in Elasticsearch, even though we've sort of installed it, we, we still have to do some configuration uh, in there. And it's pretty simple because there's just two configuration files you have to play with. One is JVM options. This basically sets the size of how much RAM you want uh, your Elasticsearch configuration uh, instance to use. One gig is the default, but you can actually bring this down to about 256 uh, gigs of RAM. So that's actually it's a nice small installation as you can run this on your laptop quite quite easily. And the other one is the Elasticsearch configuration file, which is the, a variety of different settings for your Elasticsearch application. Uh, the Elasticsearch application, I will zoom in, some color. So by default, it's got a whole lot of documentation there with some default settings and nothing else. So effectively, if this file was empty, that's pretty much exactly what it would be now. So what we're going to do is we're going to add some settings to it. I'm not going to type them out. OK, so the settings we have here is basically you give your cluster a name. So in our case, we're calling it ES data. The node name is solo because it's running a single single node, and then you give the parts to the folders that we created. So as you can see, we've got one for data, one for logs, and the one for repo. Those are the three folders we configured. Um, this is where you configure the network. So local is for like the local host addresses. Your site is for like 192 type addresses, or you can also have things like your actual um, network interface cards. So Ian, that's the network interface card on on my virtual server. So that'll add that to the list of listening uh, ports, uh, devices as well. And the port you're going to run on by default is 9200 for Elasticsearch, right? Done. So again, all that is here. These are the settings. So your file could literally just be that if you wanted to. And uh, so the network host thing, you can, that's fine as well, as long as you don't want to connect to it from externally. So what I've done will actually allow external connections as well. <clears throat> so after we've set up the server, uh, we want to set it up as a service that runs automatically on Linux. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a system D, what's called a system D unit. I mean, any of your uh, sysadmins or even most of you guys would probably have heard of system D. That's what starts and stops services on, on uh, Linux, uh, most systems. Again, I'm not going to type this out. So, okay. So again, what I, what this file does is it just it just tells Linux how to start up the process, uh, you know, how to start up Elasticsearch. So we're going to say we want the user to run as sorry, we want the service to run as the under the user Elastic under the group Elastic, which is the one user we just created. It gives some additional uh, information about uh, limits for the process, which is like the maximum number of files and uh, maximum number of process subprocesses you can uh, start up with this process. Uh, what the start command is, which is the Elasticsearch executable, and you always want to restart if something crashes, and you want to give it a 10-second delay before we try to restart. And the bottom one is just telling where to install the service. Okay. So now we just want to enable that service. Which is now enabled and we want to start the service. And now hopefully we can see it coming out. <clears throat> Yep, started and all good. So basically Elasticsearch is now running. And as I said, this particular step for setting up Elasticsearch is optional. If you guys uh, are interested, you could use a hosted service. And in many cases, I would recommend doing that if you uh, don't want to be bothered doing this particular step or managing an Elasticsearch installation. <clears throat> 
Um, okay, so how do we know Elasticsearch is up and running? Let's test it out. Cool. So uh, has anybody heard of Postman? Yep, people have heard of Postman, excellent. So Postman is a very cool tool and I highly recommend doing that. It's just that I'm doing everything in the command line right now. People have heard of curl, C-U-R-L, yep. So that's another tool for actually working with APIs on the command line. What I'm using now is called HTTPy. Has anybody heard of that? Okay, so it's a, kind of like almost a curl replacement. It's, it's, it's more user-friendly, I think. It's, uh, as I said, this is the kind of output you get. So it formats your output, colorizes it, does all sorts of cool things with it. Um, so it makes it easy when I'm actually trying to show people what's happening to use that. So that's what I'm gonna be using for the rest of the demo when I'm interfacing with, um, with the web servers and web services. So it's HTTP, localhost 9200. By default, that's what Elasticsearch gives you. If you see the screen, things should be good, right? So that means everything's up and running. So as I said, indexes are kind of like tables. So what that command does basically is just lists all your indices or tables in Elasticsearch of which we have none. Okay, so there's no no, no, no data in there at the moment. <clears throat> so step two, so we've done the Elasticsearch install. We are now going to create indexes on Elasticsearch. Okay, so there are three indexes that we need to create. Um, actually, by default, if you've got uh, a, a single node, this is the only time you need to do it. If you've got more than one node on your Elasticsearch cluster, you don't need to do this. You only need to create the partner configs uh, index. The other two get created automatically anyway, but because we're running on a single node, this setting over here, and, and this document actually explains why, uh, so you can go ahead and read that and it'll explain to you what the uh, reason is for doing this. Um, the number of replicas is one, which means uh, when you create a table or index on a single node cluster, it has an issue because it can't create a replica node somewhere else because there is a replica index somewhere else because there's only one node. So it's still, it'll still work, it'll just be unhappy about it. <clears throat> so we want to reduce the number of replicas to zero because we can't have replicas on a single node. <clears throat> okay, so that's basically the point of manually creating these indexes. Otherwise, you can just, you only need to create the config one. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to create these indexes manually. And then I'll just give you a look at what they look like. That's it. So this is, this is how you create an index, right? This is telling you the settings for the index. You want one shard. Uh, a shard is a, a how many times, how, how you want to divide a particular table up across multiple servers. So we only, again, we only have one server. So we'll just have one shard. We have no replicas because again, we have only one server. So that's the setting we wanna have, right? One shard, zero replicas. So now that's the setting for the index. And what we need to do is put that index into Elasticsearch. And we wanna put it into the partner configs. I really need to watch my spelling here because this could cause issues if I get it wrong. So if you are following and I do make a typo, let me know. Um, so we put partner configs uh, and we give it that configuration and hopefully that works okay. And if we, yep, so we have an index now, it's green and there's no documents in there. Um, we can also have a look at what it contains. Nothing. So it's got a settings, which uh, as you can see down here, number of replicas zero, number of shards one. Okay, so that's good. So now we're gonna do the same thing for the other two uh, indexes, which are the changes, partner changes, and partner records. So those are the three indexes we are gonna use. And I'm gonna explain what goes into these things uh, as we progress. So yesterday when I told you about how every time uh, it does the harvest and detects a change, 
it stores that change. So each one of those changes is stored in the partner changes index. Okay, and this is the data field for that change. So it tells you when the change happened, what the source system uh, you, you're dealing with, what the NUC of the uh, organization that has changed, what the field was that changed, and what the value of the field was before the change, and what the value of the field was after that change. So you can track pretty much everything about that change, right? So, um, so as you progress and uh, as you do harvesting every day, you can kind of see how uh, things changing. And because you're in Elasticsearch, you can uh, use the visualization tools like Kibana to do graphs and fancy stuff with what's changing, who's changing the most, why are people changing, who's suspending, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole lot of uh, additional for fun statistics you can play with, or I don't know, it might provide actual value for you at some stage. <clears throat> um, so hopefully now we've got three index set up. Yep, three indexes set up, all green, all clean. So that's it. So we are now done with that part two. And now we're up to part three. So part three is actually running and, uh, sorry, building, checking out building and configuring the harvester. So let's do that. So again, the code is um, on GitHub, under MQ library, there's two components to it. One is the resource sharing partners harvest and one is the resource sharing partners sync. So those are the two components we're gonna be uh, building and configuring and setting up, okay? so. Let's start with the harvester. So we're going to check that out with a git. I think I spelled that all right. No, I haven't. There is two. Shouldn't be asking for a password. Yeah, that's because that doesn't exist because it's just harvest. There you go. Okay, so we check it out, clone it, and we build it. And to build, we just go into the project and run this command. No, we don't do that. Sorry, I've got to do one more thing first, and this is just uh, to save time for downloading. Um, I've got a copy of the repository on my machine. I just need to link to it. Otherwise, it will download all the packages it needs to um, for dependencies. Cool. Okay, so we run the build command, which is this thing here. Okay, so this is gonna go through, it's just gonna build and create a distributable package for us. <laughs> also, I should point out, like uh, I've got all the steps here as well, but if you actually wanted to see it um, in action, there's YouTube videos going through exactly what I'm doing right now with a lot better typing. So it should take should take more than a few more seconds, hopefully. Cool. And we're done. So we are now going to grab the package that it created, which is in this folder. Uh, so it should be called resource sharing partners harvest version number dash disk dot hard of GZ again, all in the documentation. So we're just gonna unzip the package that it created, and this is like a default clean installation package. 
unconfigured you know, from one to three. Um, <coughs> so these are the uh, files in there. And the one we are interested in at the moment now is, is after properties, because this is the configuration for uh, how the harvester is going to run. <coughs> so obviously, you can see the uh, settings that need to be filled in. We need to tell it where the Elasticsearch um, URL is. And if there's a username and password, you're going to stick that in there as well. <coughs> Sorry, the other ones are already pre-populated. So ILRS is the base URL for the uh, ILRS, uh, ILRS system where all the contact information for Australian universities is. Uh, LAD is where all the uh, NUC symbols are, as well as what the suspension statuses are. That URL is uh, there as well. Those are the websites I showed you yesterday. Uh, to Pune, that's the location of the CSV file from New Zealand where the NUC symbols and the contact information are, are stored. And then um, for emails, the emails that come from Tapuna with the status of whether the library's uh, resource sharing status is suspended or not, that email at the moment for us gets sent to our uh, Office 365, uh, uh, an Office 365 account in, in, uh, as part of our university email system. Now that's actually quite complicated to deal with because you have to deal with central IT about um, getting them to set up apps and various other bits and pieces. So this uh, graph system actually works also with the uh, public, like uh, free to use uh, Outlook email accounts as well. So if your organization wants to harvest emails using the system, you probably, if, if, if you can set up an Outlook, three, Office 365 Outlook account in your organization to do what I will show you in a bit, you can do that or it's much easier just to set up an external one free uh, account and get your resource sharing emails sent to that, and then it can harvest those emails from there. But uh, what will happen now is I will just copy the configured one. Does anybody actually use uh, Office 365 for their campus stuff? Yep, so, well, quite a few of you guys do. Anybody not? What, what do you guys use? Gmail, Gmail. okay, so, uh, yep, cool. Um, yeah, so th this only harvests Outlook at the moment. Uh, and you can write a module, uh, you could write a module to do Gmail as well, it's just that I've done it with Outlook because we were using Outlook. Uh, but I have actually made it so that you can use the public free Outlook account. So again, just create a free Outlook account and we'll go through the process of how to set up, set up in a bit. Um, okay, so. So this is what a uh, completed configuration file would look like. So I've added the local host 9200 because that's what our ins uh, elastic search installation is. And I've configured the email address, which is uh, I've created, it's, this is the pre-public one, right? So I've created an address called lib.resourcepartners at outlook.com.au. Uh, and then I'll show you how we set up the client ID and client side secret and uh, generate token, how I generate tokens and stuff when we're doing the harvest because it's about a six minute, seven minute, sometimes we eight minute depending on internet. Uh, section where when we're doing the harvest, it's going to go out uh, and harvest ILRS. And I told you yesterday that if I do it too fast, it breaks the system. So I need to take it really nice and slowish. Um, so while that's happening, we'll go through the process of how to set up your um, OAuth tokens and stuff. <clears throat> so to connect to Outlook, we use OAuth 2. Um, I had never used OAuth 2 prior to <laughs> me doing this, so I learned a fair bit about that while I was doing this, which was a huge plus for this. Um, so also the largest component of the project was that, which is kind of silly. Um, okay, so now the application is configured with the settings we need, and I'm gonna run the harvester and hopefully, oh no, I can't, sorry, ah, I've got two things. I need to set up two configuration files first. One is actually configuring Outlook, right? So, um, Okay, this is a OAuth 2 token. Okay, so this is the kind of, this is what you need to send to Outlook when you actually want to authenticate to Outlook. Um, so there's a access token, which actually allows you access, and there's a refresh token, which uh, you can use again to create a new access token. So we'll go through that process of how we actually generate this file during that seven minute harvesting period. But I need to put this into the, uh, the config section, the config index of Elasticsearch so that the harvester knows, uh, can, can use that to actually authenticate and do its work, right? So I need to first create this configuration. 
local host 9200 and I needed to go into the part the config section but, thank you partner config section I really you know, really need to be very active when you're doing that it's, it's like misspelling a table name when you're doing a SQL query basically so <laughs> it ends up very badly um, HD put localhost and partner configs config and Outlook is the configuration item. And I want to add the refresh token to it. Cool, successful. My internet connection is unstable. That's not part of this demo. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see if that is on there. Okay, so that's the access token that I showed you. It's now sitting in Elasticsearch, okay? So um, Outlook is not configured. Um, now, the other thing I showed you uh, yesterday was the configuration for your institution. So when we're setting up um, <clears throat> resource sharing partners, we have a specific configuration for our, our partners, right? So this covers all of the customized settings that you would have for a specific partner. So like what currency you want to use with that partner, it's pretty much the same for all partners for us, right? Because we, we're all, uh, yeah, we're using the same profile for everything pretty much. Um, so like it basically you've got your settings for your ISO ILL server, your ports, your various profiles of borrowing you want to use, um, whatever stuff you've got configured in Alma for resource sharing partners, this is where you set up set it up to use it, right? So we create this configuration file with all the values that we'd want to set up a partner with. So when we're using the API to create a partner, we take the information that comes from the harvester, we combine it with this data, and then update Alma. Okay, so that way, if you want to change, say if you are changing from NLA VDX host and they change their server name, for example, to something else, you just make a change here in this configuration file, updated in Elasticsearch, and run the sync service again. And it will go through and update all your records in Alma with the new values, for example. So you can do bulk changes via this configuration method, right? Now it's critical what you need to do is <clears throat> you need to put this configuration file at, uh, at a point where, let me just get this up again. It's the same as your NUC symbol. So for Macquarie University, our NUC symbol is NMQU. And Therefore, at that location is what I want to stick that config in. Okay, so now if I look at so that config file is now there, and it's a Macquarie University one, right? So this is the Macquarie University specific one. So if you are sharing the system with other people and you have multiple uh, institutions harvesting each person in there sticks in their NUC symbol and their configuration for that uh, for, for themselves under that NUC symbol. And we'll see when we're doing the sync how that comes into play, okay? So at the moment, there's only just Macquarie University in here, uh, as you can see, but as I said, you can actually share the system with other people. So you can have one instance of this all running and multiple people can use it. So like, as I said, Unisa could host it for like Windows and Adelaide as well and all all you do is basically change your NUC symbol and add your own API key when you're making the sync call, and we'll show you how that works, to then um, sync your institution using somebody else's uh, installation of this system. Okay, so let's run the harvest. Fingers crossed. Okay, so we just harvested the lad. Uh, now we're harvesting from ILRS. So now this is going to take about seven minutes. Okay. Uh, while that's sitting there, this is the Outlook uh, email account that we're using. And as you can see, all uh, the VDX updates have been coming through for probably a few weeks now. Um, 
so there's about 46 emails and we even had one today we just one just hang on, thursday sorry that's not today that's yesterday um so all these emails come through and as you as you see in this uh these emails come in with suspension suspension data right so we'll just leave that sitting here for a second uh one thing you also have to be aware of is after you create your account you have to create a folder called processed because what happens is when an email gets processed it gets put into the processed folder okay um so how does all that work with the outlook stuff okay so outlook.com.au forward you to somewhere else oh, okay let me just start another window All you have to do here is this free create an account. That's all I've done. Uh, I've called this one, uh, the one I'm using now, I've called it uh, lib.resourcepartners at outlook.com.au, right? So there's, it, it's simple, I'm sure you, it's like setting up Gmail account or any other account, just pretty straightforward. Um, so I'm not really gonna go into that. But once you have created your account, um, if you actually wanna start doing API calls against it, you have to set up OAuth2 authentication for every app you wanna have that integrates with your account. The place that we do that is apps.dev.microsoft.com. That's the portal for managing accounts, uh, sorry, uh, uh, managing applications for your account. So you log in again as your your email address that you set up. And that takes you to a portal where you can uh, manage your applications that you create that integrate with uh, your Outlook accounts. So I'll just take you through this one. So when you create a new when you create a new app, it gives you an app ID, um, and that app ID is the same one that I showed you on the uh, configuration file somewhere here, wasn't it? Anyway, so I'll, I'll get to it in a second. Yeah. So in that config also configuration file, client ID is this thing up here. And that's the same as the app ID here, app ID slash client ID, right? So that's, that's one piece of information you need after you create the app. The second piece of information you need is a secret. So every time you create generate new password, it creates a new secret for you. You get to see that once, so keep it safe, and you'll never see it again. You'd have to delete and recreate it <clears throat> if you forget what it is. Um, so that's the second part you see is the client secret, and that goes in here, okay, in that section there. And obviously your email address is the one you created. So those are the three pieces of information you need for the configuration file. Um, if you want to generate the uh, <clears throat> generate the actual token, um, you need to have an application hosted somewhere. And in, in my case, I hosted my on localhost, right? Because what happens is, we'll go through that process now, actually, maybe that would be easier to see. So I've got a little application which sits on here called login. So I can log in, I've, I've got the setup for multiple other things as well. But I can log in as lib.resourcepartners.outlook.com, which is basically a URL you go to. And this is all well documented on the Microsoft OAuth 2 site, what that contains, right? But basically, we open, uh, it's, I've already logged in, so it'll says choose an account. So that's, a, that's the account I'm choosing. And then it takes you to a screen which says, hey, okay, cool. Um, this application is asking for these things. Uh, click on yes, and then it sends you to a URL. And that has to be a URL that you host somewhere. In my case, I host a local host, which is good because it just redirects to local host and my application then extracts the information from that response. And then I just click the generate token button. And that's where I get my token from. I will make that file, I haven't done it yet, but I will make that file available so you know, uh, so you can use it for generating um, tokens for yourself as well. And if you look at, and as you can see, that is pretty much the JSON token that that we that we uh, 
what, that I uploaded into the um, configuration. Okay, so that's how we get the token. And again, that, that stuff is actually documented quite well in, in, as part of the Artbook uh, API. Okay, so let's see how we're doing with the harvest. Oh, cool, we've done it. Uh, oh, excellent, we've done. Uh, oh, there you go, your emails are disappearing. Cool, emails are processed. Um, so we've harvested everything. Cool, harvest is done. Um, how long did that take? Oh, 351, yeah, cool, excellent. Okay, so, um, so the harvest is done. So we can have a look at what's in there. So we've loaded 1,158 partners, and we've had recorded 5,132 changes, which is uh, usually pretty high for the first time you do it because it's created a whole lot of entries, and every time we create something, it's considered a change. <coughs> and you can have a look at some of them. Um, Uh, sorry. So if you look at that, uh, what is so it's gone and harvested. This is the data for Macquarie University, right? So what have we got? So it's got the record in there. Um, so it's got the record in there. We've got the uh, details about the address. It's pulled in all the address information. It's got multiple addresses in there. So there's a, what is it? We've got a address details address type. So we've got a postal address. We've got a main address. And we've got a billing address, which is the same as the postal address. We've got the ILL uh, email address. Uh, we've got the Fax number, the IL phone number, and the current state is suspended. Does anybody know somebody who's suspended right now? Um, I think we are. What's your knock symbol? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it might be uh, N U W. N U W. Sorry. It might be. I don't know. I'll search for it on my phone. What's your Sue? Um, none. N U N. Uh, try Adver. A B U N. Adver. Triple AI is suspended right now. Triple AI? AR, Arthur Roger. Cool. Excellent. Cool. Here we go. We've got one. Oh, state is suspended. There you go. So uh, suspension starts at uh, 20th of the 7th, 20th. Oh, it's a long one. Okay, 20th of the 7th, 20th. Is that right? 20th, 20th. Yep, cool. Okay, there you go. Excellent. So, and finishes at the end of the year. Um, and now the state is obviously currently suspended. So we know that. Uh, so it knows. So it basically tops all the data, house all the suspension data, house uh, all suspensions, everything, and it cr creates the record as it currently looks at the time of doing your harvest, right? So um, that's the harvester. The harvester is now gone. Grab all the data, all the data in there should be pretty good. Um, 15 minutes? Yep. So I, how much time do I have left? Breaks 11 to 11.15. 11, oh, sorry. So just, just keep going, but just so you across the time. Sure, sorry. I was, how much time do I have? Oh, so I'm actually over time now. Sorry. No, you've got, well, you've got five weeks. Okay, so same process now. I'm just going to rush to the next part then, obviously. Uh, Okay, so the next part I'm going to do is pretty much the same process that I did with the harvester, but I'm going to do it with the uh, the sync component as well, right? Go in there, MVN D. So this is going to build the um, <clears throat> the sync service.
Sorry, I should be going a bit faster than this, but uh, I'm doing a demo. So. Actually, while that's happening, um, Okay, again, same process after the thing is, is built. <coughs> Target resource training dist target. So unzip the package and we have to go in and configure it. It's not much to configure at all because I'll show you now. This is basically all the settings we need to do. One is the your, your, your Elma URL, uh, your elastic search URL, uh, this is the same as the harvester. Uh, and then this is how you want it to be presented. So what host are you connecting to? What port does, so what host is the service gonna be running on? What port and what path? Um, that's pretty much it. And um, I'm going to copy the settings from the command folder. And as I said, this is our API. Uh, so the URL for our Elmo, that's the Elasticsearch URL and username passwords don't exist at the moment. We're thinking we're binding to all IP addresses and running on port 8080 and sync path is partner dash sync. Okay, and that's it. So we will now run the sync service. Uh, resource. Okay, so the resource sharing service is now running. I'm gonna duplicate the session and move to another command line, we are going to play with it now. So uh, localhost 8080 is where it's running. Partner sync, you provide your NUC symbol and then the command you want to run. In this case, let's do a preview, but we also need to add our API key as well. So depending on what client you're using, whether you're using Postman, or whether you're using curl, this all works a bit differently. In for uh, for HTTP, um, we just stick this at the end of the uh, command. So hopefully, what that's going to do is it's going to trigger activity on the resource sharing partner service and. It's going to go off now. And the first thing it does, obviously, is it has to pull all your resource records from Alma. So that's what it's doing now. It's pulling, uh, I think it's probably about, you've got about 1,200 records in there, and it's going to pull them all. And it should take just a couple of seconds to do it. Um, they come down in approximately 100 at a time, and 1,200, that's 12 calls. And I'll go back to that for my bad because I forgot to add the timeout section here. So because it takes a bit longer, you need to increase the timeout a bit. Okay, that's the call that's done. So basically it's telling me now, these are all the <coughs> records that are actually going to be changed in Alma if I do a sync. So I'm doing a preview now. So this is like what records are going to change. Um, Python, Python, JSON, So if I just do a count of say the link, this is a 91 record. So basically there's 91 records in this output file that are gonna be updated if I do a sync, right? Now I don't know what's changed in each of those records, do I? So uh, if you look at a record, it's gonna give you the full complete post update record. If you wanna see what's actually changed in the record, um, then we do a different call. It's changes. And then it gives you a list of all the changes that are going to occur. Now, as you see, it didn't actually have to go and re get all the uh, 1200 records again from Elm because I've cached those records. Uh, and now every operation you do until you do a sync will be from that cache. You can expire that cache. There's another command for that. Uh, another API endpoint for that. And um, after you do a sync, it clears the cache because you're now going to have a difference between your cache and a Alma. So it'll re-get it after you do a sync. Um, so this tells you, like, uh, for example, NMQH, 
uh, the status field share has changed and before it was inactive, now it's active. So basically this institution is gonna be set as active. And uh, this one up here, the name has changed from Massey University Wellington Campus to uh, same thing with CPU at the end um, and so on. So all your changes are, uh, this one here has changed the phone number and, and so on. So there's, yeah, every change you've had and there'll probably be quite a few changes in there as well. Um, and yeah, and that's how you check out your changes. Now, if you actually wanna do the changes, you do a sync. <clears throat> And now what's gonna happen in the background, hopefully, if everything's going well, it will, um, done. So we've actually now just updated all our records, all 91 records now are uh, now updated. So if I did a preview again, what do you think we'd see? Um, hopefully nothing. So it's now gonna, again, it's gonna go back. Because I've done a sync, it invalidates the cache. It's gonna go back, it's gonna download the 1200 records,